name is Viviana Kosh. I'm the community archaeologist at the Cluj Powys Archaeological Trust. I was supposed to deliver this presentation with visual artist uh, Sean Harris from Wild Boar Press. Uh, Sean has worked with the, with the Trust on several projects and activities. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today and he sends his apologies. Therefore, I will uh, present also on his behalf. Uh, First of all, for those who do not know about uh, the Chloe Pavis Archaeological Trust, uh, we are an educational charity which was established uh, in 1975. We are based in Mid Wales, uh, specifically in Welshpool, and uh, we are one of the four archaeological trusts which uh, um, uh, work to record, interpret and protect uh, all different aspects of the Welsh historic environment. The, um, the primary objective of the Trust has always, always been the, uh, to advance education of the public in archaeology. And we achieve these uh, um, with the support of funding for a variety of sources, uh, but I have to say mainly from the Welsh Government. This includes uh, the provision of advice for uh, local uh, authorities uh, on archaeology and planning, uh, undertaking archaeological projects for private and public sector uh, clients uh, and uh, obviously they re delivering uh, programs of uh, community archaeology um, events uh, and activities. As you can see we, we are covering quite a large area because we are covering the whole of Powys, uh, Wrexham, Flintshire, Denbyshire, inside of Conway and a little tiny portion of Breckenshire. So it's, it's a quite vast area and um, I work a lot with rural communities, which it's adding a challenge in the full um, picture. Um, as I mentioned before, education and engagement has always been one of the core values of the Trust. Therefore, in the past few years, the Trust has decided to invest a little bit more money in this area. And in 2013, with, with the help of a CADO grant and aid program, um, we created the Education and Outreach Department made of one but, but it's an achievement but i have to say all the members of the trust are really deeply dedicated to uh, the engagement and education of the public um, we are delivering a variety of activities which involve field work uh, training of volunteers and young people uh, we regularly uh, run work uh, work placement experiences during the summer and we constantly have university students doing work placements with us uh, um, we uh, run workshops on uh, uh, private and public schools and other institutions uh, uh, we deliver a variety of outreach events attending uh, uh, fairs and delivering talks uh, and of course we are also trying to uh, create uh, community models that can be reproduced uh, um, in um, in different places uh, of our region. I was really happy today because it's just it was for me just an extra confirmation of the fact that uh, archaeology can be really a powerful tool, and I think we don't need to spend more time on say how effective it can be on people's lives not just on a social and intellectual but also on a physical point of view um, and it's through archaeology that we also uh, try to help the government to reach uh, um, uh, the United Nations uh, uh, development goals uh, and uh, is the fact that archaeology can link so well uh, to a variety of uh, social elements uh, uh, which are not just uh, uh, secluded to education this, is, this map is just showing some of the projects that uh, uh, I run together with my colleagues uh, between 2015 and, uh, and 16. And, uh, we, we're delivering a variety of projects. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, um, the Welsh government uh, has uh, uh, luckily decided to place culture at the centre of people's lives. So there's been a lot of investment on uh, delivering uh, cultural projects. Uh, um, which are specifically aiming at uh, um, uh, disadvantaged communities. In fact, those areas that are marked on the map as the green areas is what we usually refer in Wales as community first areas. Now, to me, this is a little, little tiny problem because although all the monies are going in these areas, I still need to cover a big region and uh, there's always this challenge and this risk not to leave any, any community behind. So this is one of uh, my first challenges, our geographical distribution 
uh, of communities. And when we were talking about this morning partnerships, to me, partnerships are essential because I can never possibly cover this large area without working with local societies, museums, schools. Uh, um, and I have to say, I, I work a lot with Worcester University and uh, Wrexham universities as well. Um, and it's actually funny because I really think that collaboration is at the core of our job. Every time I try to deliver a project, especially with young people, I always try to link with museums, or libraries, archives, because I think we can deliver so much more if we work in partnership. The second massive, massive challenge, which I think is affecting all of us, uh, are the, the cuts. I work a lot with local schools. Uh, most of the sessions today were about education in uh, uh, primary, secondary school and universities. But I try to do a lot of work with the youth centers. Well, this year there's been a 20% of cuts in England and Wales of uh, youth uh, uh, services. Now, all the community archaeologists probably can agree with me that uh, a large portion of our job is uh, it's a very time-consuming part of creating relationships. I mean, it's very, very different than working on a site. You have a, your time, uh, time frame, you need to do your research, you need to do your excavation, you need to produce your report. Uh, community archaeology is very much about creating trust, creating relationships, and sometimes it can take months, months. In my particular case, and I'm using uh, this new uh, project funded by HLF and Loft Heritage, it took me three months to establish uh, um, a good partnership in the Wrexham area to find out uh, that there were 500,000 pounds cut in the area and they closed uh, the youth centers I was supposed to work with. Uh, these had a massive impact on the project itself uh, uh, because all of a sudden I found myself I had to recreate all the that big machine and, and, and start the engine again. So we are really asking a lot uh, uh, to local groups uh, in terms of support and then most of the time we are asking to do it on a voluntary basis which if you really think about it is not really fair. And the biggest challenge, uh, um, it's uh, now demanded by the Welsh Government as well, it's we need to reach new groups, you need to reach uh, uh, vulnerable groups and this is not easy at all. I'm bringing here two examples, the one on the, uh, on the left side, it's, um, a, a, it's a privately owned school, it's a care home. These are all kids that be removed from families and from a violent situation and a sexual abuse situation. It's a very tough audience and I have to say I've been working in Wales for far, four years now and it's the first time I've been bullied about my accent. <laughs> But what do you do? I totally agree uh, with Karenza when she says archaeology is an instrument. Every time I approach groups, uh, sometimes I feel bad because I put archaeology on one side because if I can deliver some core values which are linked to respect and uh, more linked to citizenship, especially with this group, bingo, I reach my goal. And then I can use archaeology to do so. A lot of the time when young people ask me, why have you decided to become an archaeologist? Uh, it's not really because, I mean, the, the immediate answer is not, oh, because I love the past. I love the discipline. It, it gives me discipline. It's one thing that I always appreciated about archaeology. It's discipline. It teaches me respect. It teaches me certain values that I struggle to find anywhere else. And with this particular group on the left side, um, We've done some very, very interesting work on historic maps. I love working with historic maps and, and, and do map regression exercises with the kids because all of a sudden they just realize, oh my gosh, but really things can change so quickly? Yes, they do. Um, I was mentioning before, uh, during one of the discussions, we've done some work across the border, on the Welsh border, on the, on the Shropshire side, uh, with this small local primary school and the local uh, members of uh, the community to develop these uh, handling box uh, for primary schools, but also for all the people affected by dementia. And I'm really proud of this project. It's so beautiful. Uh, I'll let you watch it, please, rather than talk. I hope the sounds work. Does it work? 
Let's try. Maybe if I'll start. Yes. Uh, my name is Judy Crabb. Um, I'm Vice Chair of CPRE, that's Campaign for the Protection of Rural England, um, and this is our Shropshire branch. The project is called Memories of the Landscape. It's an intergenerational oral history project that aims to bring older and younger people together to explore what the local landscape is all about, um, both how it came about, what it is today, and how vulnerable it is, because as CPRE, we are concerned that people understand and cherish the landscape that we're so lucky to have, particularly here in Shropshire. The young and older people have got together to explore that together and to create some materials that can be used by others in the future to do just the same. We've been working now with the school here in Newcastle on the Plan since about October. So we've had four sessions bringing the older and young people together to share memories and to capture those memories and look at the materials that can help to bring them to life for future generations. Older and younger people have such a lot in common and particularly when that is about the area that they live in and they're sharing. So bringing them together can be very, very special because they're sharing memories that perhaps they don't talk to, or the older people don't have opportunity to talk to younger people very much about. And the younger people have just been in awe of the sort of stories that they've been able to listen to. And then we go right back to prehistoric times, which has been a fascination to everybody that's been concerned because this is such an historic and interesting area. And they've taken that right through to the present day, um, looking at um, the ways in which farming has changed, how fishing has changed, and how all these things have had an impact on the landscape and the lives of the people that live here. It's not something that would have happened naturally, um, you know, talking to the teachers at the school and um, they hadn't sort of worked with the older members of the community, so it was a, a really nice way of sort of connecting the two together really. And also from my point of view, seeing, you know, the different views and opinions from young people and old people in terms of what's special to them about, you know, the landscape of, of this part of the Shropshire Hills. loved it because uh, unfortunately archaeology is not um, brought up very often in the classroom and the fact that they could handle objects uh, without being worried of breaking them or damaging them it just gave them this real nice contact uh, uh, with something tangible because sometimes it, we're talking about archaeology we're talking about heritage but it's not it's not really tangible at, at times so being able to touch real items uh, um, it just uh, it just really teased their imagination and uh, uh, their pleasure for discovery. Well, this is our final celebration, bringing everybody together to see for the first time just what they have actually helped us to create, which is basically two handling boxes. One is going to be used in schools with future um, generations of school children here in Newcastle and Clun and in the cluster of schools it works with in this area. And the other is to be used in reminiscence with older people and for community groups that they can borrow free of charge. Uh, we've been doing a lot of research on the past, mm. how things have changed. Been meeting Mrs Buckle, Miriam, uh, Mr Yeward, Mr Malcolm Jones. Quite pleasing because we find a lot of it out and a lot of information. Telling us lots about when they were children and um, how things have changed. Um, I find it very interesting and very enjoyable.
Well, we were talking about uh, how to demonstrate impact, uh, and I tell you, every month I need to um, I need to submit to the uh, Deputy Minister uh, of uh, Culture, Sport and Tourism numbers about uh, uh, the work we are doing with the Trust in terms of outreach and engagement. I would love to send something like this because we were saying this morning uh, it's very much about uh, emotions uh, and I think something like this could tell much more in terms of evaluation than simple numbers. So maybe we should move away from main numbers and, and try to give more qualitative uh, uh, information. And then the fourth challenge is that we need to find constantly new ways of engage people. Becky Calm, Akito Regional, I don't know if you recently had a look at job descriptions, but they are really asking a lot and all the time. It's like, uh, uh, you need to include all these elements and it's not always easy. And I would like to use this case study uh, just to, just to uh, discuss with you one of the ways I try constantly to push the boundaries and try new things. I mean, we got uh, technology goes very, very quickly. We're, we're talking about apps before. Um, one element I use a lot in the classroom and also with young people are virtual reality. They are just amazed because it just makes it so visible and understandable. So it's one of the things that work really well. I'm using as a case study some work that we recently done uh, in the Walton Basin area, which is in Radnosha. It's uh, an impressive uh, uh, prehistoric landscape which spans from uh, Paleolithic uh, up to uh, medieval time and is st still very much lived by the local communities who totally appreciate the um, historical value of the area. We have uh, done some field walking with the uh, primary school stud students from the Radno Valley and then we moved uh, uh, the session indoor with the sixth form students uh, um, of the Lady Hawkins schools, uh, in which we try something different. We, our sessions always start from artifacts and from the landscape and, uh, and, and the location of different uh, uh, heritage assets. But this time I wanted to push a little bit the boundaries and I invited Sean Harris to come with me. Sean Harris used visual images uh, to create new narratives. So with the students, based on uh, uh, the archaeological information that we have on the Walton Basin and uh, the artifacts that, be, uh, that were found, uh, the students develop a storyboard which would look in the future like a nice film. So basically the work of Sean, uh, everything starts always from sing single objects and he just turned them into beautiful films uh, um, and animate and create narratives which are, work perfectly with especially younger audiences. But they are also very challenging for older audiences because it's just opening new views on new technologies. Just to give you a glimpse uh, of his work, uh, there again, I'm afraid I'm going to let you watch another film uh, for some reason. It's not like me doing it. Sorry about that.
this particular project, young people work with Sean recreating the sounds, recreating the sound of the voices of people, and uh, developing the narrative from real objects. Uh, This is really the sort of technology that we develop with, with Sean, and it works really well with SCORE because it links to so many different aspects of uh, design technology, IT, uh, English as well, and uh, a variety of other, of other subjects. Uh, so hopefully some of the activities we, we, we do on a, daily, on a daily basis uh, might give you some hints and maybe some, some thinking for ways to uh, evaluate the impact of what we are doing in forms of uh, also evaluation and how to prove that what we are doing with archaeology uh, it's actually very, very effective. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.